Good morning. My name is Carolyn Baranowski. Welcome to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. We're celebrating your faith made well today. Um, anyway, I didn't check that out ahead of time, sorry. Anyway, um, this is the Lord's day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Beautiful day it is too. Uh, life of the church. In your bulletin, as you know, there's several announcements. We just want to remind you of the blood drive on July 9th. And there's a uh, number to call or thing where you can sign up so they know you're coming. We want to remind you va Vacation Bible School is July 13th to 15th in the evening. And uh, the best thing of all is next Sunday will be our unity service in Zion Hall 1030 and um, Pastor Dave and uh, Betty have been in touch and uh, we're going to be singing some hymns as well as praise songs. He wants to make sure everybody really feels a part of this new beginning. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there and um, we're going to have pretzels and lemonade after. So um, if you can't eat it with us, you can take it home and celebrate with your family. We're going to have a hundred, so you can probably take two. Anyway, <laughs> by the looks of things. Anyway, um, we'll now go to our entry. Please stand for the call to worship. Be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God. Praise the name of the Lord your God. The Lord is in our midst. And now Join me in singing out loud without your mask, page 700, the hymn Abide With Me.
And one announcement I forgot to make today, the beautiful flowers on the altar are dedicated by Dana uh, in honor of his and Kathy's 50th wedding anniversary. So it's a great milestone. <laughs> And on Tuesday, Wendy Blue is turning a magic number, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, Betty, would you like to do joys and concerns? Oh, we have to pass the peace first. So let's do the good old way of passing the peace, and let's go visit everyone. Visit everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, that's a joy right there, wasn't it? Yes. So, do we have any joys and concerns? I have a joy that um, it's been, uh, the past 15, 60 months have been top of all this major challenge. And I just want to praise God and, and bless all the ones, all the staff and the volunteers who have kept this church going. No matter what small part anyone has made, it's been a help to keep us going. And hopefully we'll see the, this in the end of the tunnel. We have a light of a new day, and um, things will get better from here. And uh, I, I hate to announce or acknowledge just one person, but um, I'd like to announce Dana. Yes. Uh, yes. Because it is efforts just to keep this building in plant going and also all the efforts that he and the other volunteers did for the parsonage over the last month have been extraordinary and I just want to, want to thank him for all his efforts. Anyone else? Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. We are here before you this morning to praise and worship you. We praise you for the many blessings you give us each day. We thank you for your unceasing love, compassion, and mercy. We trust in your every plan for us. We humbly come to you in prayer as a child comes to their father, as we remember that we are made in your image. 
Guide us in all that we do and let us remember to do your will. Help us to remember to take care of this great earth you have given for us to dwell on. Help us to take care of this gift. Bring us all to humility and courage in reaching out to you for our needs. We ask for healing for those that are ill and injured. We ask for healing for Mae Jansen, for Barbara, for Pat Norris, for Betsy Mullen, for Dolores Colodi, for James Colodi III, for Bob Bull on his knee replacement, and continued prayers for Dorothy Crum's son, Frank. We ask for prayers for all the people in Florida, for those that are missing, and all their families, and their friends, and their loved ones. We ask for healing for Ken's back as he has treatment tomorrow. And we ask for the appreciation for the joy for the volunteers for the last 15 months. What a blessing the volunteers have been, and especially Dana. We ask for guidance for those needing to make decisions. We ask that we all remember that we work together for your kingdom. We are a team and no one stands alone. Guide us to embrace each other's ideas in our daily walk. We ask for your guidance in all we do. We ask that we walk in faith every day of our lives. Let us remember to be kind and gracious to those we pass on our walk each day. Let us be open to interruptions that they may be from you, that they may be gifts from you. Guide us to have the compassion that Jesus has. Let our lives be closer and closer to the life of Jesus. Let our faith be stronger and stronger and our trust a strong foundation. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has given us life everlasting. And now let us join together in in saying the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now the next item in the bulletin is the anthem, but the um, CD player is having a little problem today. It's not me this time. And um, choir is AOL, so we're going to skip over that. <laughs> so. Anyway, please rise for the uh, affirmation of faith led by Betty Murphy. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Now we'll follow along with the responsive reading from Psalm 30, verses 1 to 6. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. Restore me to life from among those who down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh his faithful, faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Okay, now we'll sing something beautiful, page 394. Please stand for the hymn, if you're able, please. that song and it, he made something beautiful every of every one of your lives we're glad you're here today good morning everyone good morning. we start the story today with Jesus returning across the lake from the other side where he was removing demons from a man and restoring his life he is now in a boat approaching the western side of the Sea of Galilee, probably near Capernaum. Anticipating his return on shore is a large crowd. They gather around him as he gets on land. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded with him earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. Jairus was an elected leader and likely had ties to Pharisees. He was highly respected, had a good social status, and certainly was not in poverty. Being one of the Hebrew leaders of the synagogue, this was an act of humility for him to bow at Jesus' feet and beg. He would have sent someone to do this for him, but this father was desperate, as we all would be for a little daughter that is gravely ill, wanting her to live. I wonder, did you catch the part where he petitioned for Jesus to heal her so that she would live? That is where his faith is shown. Not only did he ask for her to be healed, he expected, he knew, that Jesus could make her continue to live. So Jesus, knowing what was in Jairus' heart, went with him. As Jesus was walking, the large crowd followed along and pressed in all around him. There was a woman there. She may have been in the crowd or, most likely, watching from a distance. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. 
She had been to many doctors and suffered under their care. I'm sure they meant well, but I am not so sure what first century medicine would have been for her condition. She had also spent all the money she had, yet instead of being better, she was worse. So this may have been an incurable disease for back then. This woman heard about Jesus. She heard about him healing people. So being very desperate, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now keep in mind that because she was bleeding, she was ritually unclean, and therefore she was not to be in contact with people. She was an outcast. Imagine how this woman felt being ostracized for 12 years. Not able to visit with family or friends, she was not able to marry, not able to have children, and so on. This is a desperate woman with no other options left that she can think of. She heard of this Jesus and put all of her hope in him. For her, being unclean, to reach out and touch his robe could have made him unclean. For her to touch his robe meant that she had to get in there, in that crowd. She put all her hope into faith in Jesus. So she got deep, deep into that crowd. And she reached out and she touched his robe. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was freed, freed from her suffering. Finally, finally, she felt healed. At once, at the same time, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? Now picture this, he's in the midst of a great multitude of people. He is surrounded on all sides, and he's asking, who touched my clothes? The disciples thought this question was ridiculous. His disciples answered, you see the people crowding around against you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? They had no idea. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. It was important to Jesus to make a personal connection with this person. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He gave her a blessing and he called her daughter. In essence, he called her as one of his. It was a term of endearment. She had been unclean, ill, bleeding, and now she is hearing Jesus call her daughter, meaning that she is now reincorporated into the community. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? They had given up. The girl was dead. All hope was lost. But overhearing what they said, Jesus told Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Jesus then did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. It is important to understand that these people were crying and wailing. They were hired. In those days, it was customary to hire people to do that. To not have the loud mourning would have been a disgrace back then. So here they are wailing away. As Jesus tells them the child is not dead, but asleep, these hired people laugh at him. After Jesus put the wailers out of the house, he took the child's father and mother, 
and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talithakum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Jairus had asked Jesus to heal his daughter so that she could live. It did not occur to him that Jesus could bring her back to life after death. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and then told them, give her something to eat. Now there are some things that pop out to me in these two interwoven stories. There is a healthy, prominent, well-established, and wealthy man with good social status. Normally, others would come to him for favors. He is a ruler in the synagogue. Then there is also a woman who has no money left. She has no social status as she has been ostracized for 12 years. She has been bleeding and ill for these 12 years too. Clearly, she is not physically at her best. I would think at this point she would be rather weak. The prominent leader asks Jesus for help, and Jesus immediately goes to help. On his way, he is interrupted by the ostracized, ill, and unclean woman. He immediately stops to help her as well. To Jesus, there is no differentiation between the two people. They both get his help. Jesus sees what is in their hearts. Jesus loves them both. He does not care about earthly status, wealth, or anything else along those lines. They are both made in God's image. That is what Jesus sees. Jesus also does not consider the interruption a problem. He is gracious. I want you all to think about the past year or 15 months. I remember, I remember driving home from the church, from working in the office, and passing completely empty parking lots that would normally be full of cars. People were working from home, school children doing schoolwork at home. Mostly everything was closed. I would drive the 10 and a half miles and I would pass three cars. It was eerie. We were socially separated. There are some people now needing time to rejoin being with other people. Some people are struggling with this. Now imagine the courage it took for this woman to go into this crowd of people on her own initiative after being separated from society for 12 years. She had courage and confidence in her faith in Jesus. Another thing that pops out is that after he heals the woman and then restores life to the little girl, in both cases, he cares to make sure that their well-being continues. He tells the woman, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He tells the parents of the girl, give her something to eat. To the woman, a blessing and take care of yourself, and to the mom and dad, take care of the little girl. Give her food, give her sustenance. It's not just a quick fix. Jesus cares about their long-term well-being. Notice also both times he did not pray. Jesus has authority given by God. Jesus clearly also has power. He has divine power. Power so strong that the woman is healed from touching his robe. Be open to the healing or plan from above. What Jairus begged Jesus for is not exactly what he received. His daughter needed to be brought back. Be open to other ways that Jesus can heal. That is part of trusting him. Here were two very desperate people with their stories intertwined. Both received healing through their faith in Jesus. Both had no one else to turn to. I will also mention that when the woman touched Jesus' robe, he was surrounded by people, so much so that the disciples couldn't possibly know who touched him. 
That means other people very likely touched his robe, but her touching was different. Her faith was needed for that healing. There is no mention of anyone else being impacted from touching his clothes. It was her faith in expecting the healing. She didn't think, I hope he can heal me. She had confidence that if I reach out and touch his robe, I will be healed. Jairus had not only confidence in healing, but in his daughter living. And living after being gravely ill. Jesus made mention in both healings of their faith. To the woman, he said, your faith has made you well. And then to Jairus, he said, believe. In the book, God, M.D., Jesus, Our Great Physician, Barbara Keisman wrote that the highest level of faith that a person can display during a trial is God's peace. It is a faith that rests, believes in the love of God, even as a child would rest in his mother or father's protective arms. Our having faith is our trust in and continued trust in God through Jesus Christ. Faith continues in ups and downs as we trust in the plans of our Father in heaven. Our faith gives us hope now and forever. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 states, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The Gospel of Mark shows many of the actions of Jesus. What are the actions that we can do to show our faith? We pray, and when we pray, we anticipate Jesus' power. We have dependence on Jesus. We rely on the love of Jesus. We know we have his assurance of everlasting life. We pray a prayer with determination and courage. We are persistent in petitioning Jesus. We don't give up. Faith is trusting in Jesus when we are desperate. Faith is pulling out our courage to touch the robe of Jesus. Faith is humbling ourselves at his feet and beseeching him to help. We cannot see faith, but we know it is there. We depend on it. We have faith in Jesus, and that faith is built on trusting him. Reach out to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 states, For we live by faith, not by sight. Jesus has authority. Jesus has power. Jesus has mercy and compassion. Jesus does not mind. He actually would be happy for you to interrupt him. He wants you to. We are all made in the image of God. Ask him. Pray to him. Let your confidence in your faith in Jesus be known. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our loving God, we have faith and trust in your plan for us. We believe that your grace is sufficient for our every need. May your constant presence comfort us. Guide us so that we know your plan and that we may do your will and follow your path. Let our faith in you be ever strong. Remind us daily that you want us to interrupt you and petition you, especially when we feel we are desperate. We promise to pray to you daily and ask for what we need. Let our faith in you lead us each day. In Jesus' name, amen. And if I might add, one of my favorite verses that the people that have known me a long time know is, if ye have faith like a grain of mustard seed, nothing will be impossible to you. And 
that prayer has gotten me through many times. <laughs> Reminded me, Betty, thank you. Okay, now will the usher bring the offering forward, please, and will we rise and sing? Now please join me in the last hymn, My Hope is Built, page 368. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. <laughs>